gentlemen, welcome to Cancer Club on this Thursday. Happy to see so many familiar faces here. My name is Ol Rahim. I am the Trade Commissioner for Philip in West Africa. The topic is investing in Nigerian art. Um, today's vision or mission is to have a light conversation with some experts. Um, I am lucky to. Uh, <laughs> I am. I am lucky to know know a few. Um, so we're going to get points of view from you know from the gallery side, from the collector side, and deep into this uh, world of arts that we many of us love so much. Uh, my own art journey, um, I would say, probably started about. 12, 15 years ago. Um, like in most big cases, it always involves uh, female counterparts. I was dating someone that was really into art, and you know, she turned even the hardest um, Lagos boy into art. So we used to travel because of art to different places, and, and her impression kind of dropped off on me. Um, coming back to then in Nigeria, um, I had this almost like a grandfather figure. Now late, the great um, ambassador, Chief Olushola, had an amazing private gallery in Suwari and allowed me to you know, spend weekends there just fascinated and, and listening to his stories about art. And um, I wouldn't consider myself a collector yet. I think my uh, I, uh, I have two little pieces, or too few of them, as we speak, but um, I'm hopefully I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. And uh, like I said, I have some friends that are really dipping into the sea, so I don't think I have a choice. But not too much of this. I know that we're starting a bit late, Lagos, African time, whatever you want to call it. I would like to introduce the first speaker to introduce us to this journey before we have the panel discussions. So please, my dear friend, Ejiro, come and give us an introduction to, to this topic today. I've been asked to do something, I'm not sure I'm the best person that. <laughs> but we're talking about Nigerian art, we're talking about African art, and we're also talking about investment. Um, I will give a brief history to my own background. Originally, my training is in finance, but um, I have always been in the art world from childhood. My father had to be somebody in the know. Bush is 89, going on 90. All his life he's been working, all his life he's been experimenting. It didn't matter whether he sold or he did not sell. He just kept looking for something further, looking for something new, looking for something to show his collectors. And um, the result is um, 50 to 60 years of continuous work, focused work. Okay, um, we're talking about the journey into art, Nigerian art, and investment. First of all, originally, the artist is supposed to be like a barometer of the society. The artist is a reflection of the mood of the society. And so artists are kind of different, like musicians, they are very introspective. They go within themselves or they go into another world, they find out what is happening in their world. And they come out with different things. Now, a lot of times they're not sure about how people will respond to their pieces. Sometimes the response is like, this is rubbish. But sometimes some people look at this works and say, wow, where, where on earth did it come from? I'll tell you a small story. <clears throat> I had the privilege of um, delivering some of my art pieces to Saddam Hussein in Baghdad, personally. 
And I wasn't sure of how that would go. But I got to Baghdad and I, I met with the president and he looked at the work and the work was a gift from the president of Nigeria. He looked at the work and said, what does this work mean? And I said to him that the title of the work is Hail New Moon. And Hail New Moon describes a shining star, a bright star in the horizon. And among that shining star are other stars. And he kept looking at me, looking at their talk. And he said to me, What did you say your name is? I said, Ejiro. He said, Ejiro, I am that shining star. <laughs> and he called a few of his assistants and said, That is me. That artist from Nigeria is describing me. Now, of course, the rest is history as in it made me very comfortable in Baghdad. I was happy and all that and all that. He invited me again. Now, that is the effect of art on people. Art has always been part of our culture. In the ancient time, we have what you call court art. Court art is the art made for the enjoyment of the palace. <clears throat> so that there will be palace artists, there will be palace musicians, and the king or the queen will be able to use those arts to boast about their culture, the skills of the people. So art has always been very important. Now, how did value come into art? I say to people that price, price is what you ask for if you want to buy something. Or the seller gives you a price. But value, value is what the buyer receives. So if the, value, if, if the buyer or the receiver considers that he has something of value, then he will keep it. Then it is important to him, he will not give it out, and he will put some value to it. That is the value we are talking about today. But prior to now, I mean, the new syndrome of art as investment started really with people looking at their collection and saying, look, this piece is important. This artist has worked for 30 years, 40 years. His works are still good. His colors are still bright. He's still creating new things. And so there's conversation. There's conversation about that piece. Conversations in different parts of the world. The artist is still exhibiting. The artist has students that are learning from him every day. And people are talking about the art. People are documenting the art. So there's story around the art. And that is what gives art its value. OK, we'll take a, a Benimomo. We, we say, OK, a Benimomo was sold for half a million dollars. The year was 1969. And it is one of his dancing masquerades. If it is sold for $1 million at an auction, then it is likely that similar pieces of art for that artist, that size, that kind of year. So as we call ourselves cultural engineers, really, as cultural engineers, we're able to look at the trend. The trend. We say, OK, Bonhams. What has Bonhams been doing over 10 years? They have done maybe, OK, let's say they've done 10 exhibitions in 10 years. We look at all their catalogs. Now, the documentation of the art piece in the catalog is very important. So when the artist does an exhibition, that catalog is like an embassy for him. And people are, it's, it's a reference point. People are able to say, okay, this artist, this is what he was doing at this particular time. Art is like any other asset that is valuable, like land, it's like house, it's like, it's like gold. Now, if you have a piece of art, the first thing you should really do for every piece of art, 
is some form of authentication. It's very important. Now, <clears throat> authentication in the sense that, okay, this art is by Bruce Nuraquea. It's a 1965 piece of art, and it was created by him. And there is a letter or a certificate to that effect, which is similar to a sea of a sea of all of the land. And so it is easy to be able to transfer. My name is Yasmin, um, and I, I'm just a collector, so very good collector. <laughs> good evening, everyone. My name is Sukona Ibe. I am an art curator and a galvanist. I was formerly at Terra Culture um, and curated the 10th annual Layers Arts Auction. And um, I think I saw our art consultant at the time, Jibril. Um, I then joined the Guild of Professional Fine Artists of Nigeria as a director. Uh, most recently, I was a consultant curator at Retro Gallery in Abuja and curated the Changing Faces um, Alimi's show. And uh, yeah, I think that's, that's pretty much it. Um, hello everyone, my name is Obida. Um, I run a gallery called Oda Art. Um, I got into art actually because of the artists. They, uh, they made me do it. Uh, I'm an interior yeah. designer as well. And um, we started off sourcing art for clients. Um, after we finished their homes, they asked us to source art for them. And then I, I made a little money and then I started uh, buying art for myself. And now we have um, a gallery and um, I really enjoy it even more. Now. The co-founder of a company called She Leads Africa. Um, so we work with African women who want to build their businesses and their careers. Um, I'm also very heavily into financial services, so sit on a few financial services boards. Um, and so very excited to kind of speak a little bit about the difference between like making a, an art just as a collector, someone who enjoys it, but also potentially making it also as a financial asset, which I think is part of what we'll be discussing today. So how, how did you get into collecting art? Sure. So um, I think my love of art really came from my mom. Um, I think I, I grew up with, in a home with a lot of art. I don't think I realized how special that was until, to be honest, other people would come to my house and be like, wow, this is an amazing collection. Um, I think like my journey into to art, it kind of started slowly and then was all of a sudden. Um, I think I was pretty intimidated by like the art space and the art industry. Um, you know, I'm a pretty chill, casual person, and I think like what I had seen from art was it just seemed like very bougie and like you have to be like very dressed up and it like had to be like super fancy and if you didn't have like all the cool artists and like you were just lame and so I think that's what I thought of as the art world. Um, but I think like when I started I think finding my group as a collector, being kind of comfortable doing my own thing, understanding how it is that I actually like to consume art, like I know now I like you know, quiet gallery spaces. I don't like the big fairs and festivals. They're just not for me. Um, and I think I, when I moved into that space, I just started having much more fun with the art um, and, and thinking about it first as something that is like an, an emotional connection and something that like means something like deep to me, um, as opposed to the I think social side of collecting, which. If I'm going to be honest, it's just not something that I very much enjoy or want to be a part of. But I respect others who do. You do, you, I'll do me, and you will be. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Idra, let, let's hear from you. Um, let's, 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 let's go to tips. Which of the new Nigerian artists are you excited about? What is very important is that um, artists should be able to interact with each other and with their customers in places like workshops. Now, we, we have a workshop twice yearly in Agbarotlo where a lot of artists come out and um, you know, they work together, they interact, they inspire each other and um, they come out with good works. Now, it is in such environments that new artists spring off because the young artists and the 
older artists interact. That interaction is very important because uh, they rub off on each other and they come out with. Now, I'm not going to give any specific names now, but there are a couple of artists you must watch out for. Young artists and um, middle-aged artists. When you find them, they're, they're not necessarily the popular artists. But, uh, for example, there's a young man called, um, I wrote his name down. Or maybe you just don't want to give us your secrets. No, no, no. It's not that. It's just that you see, these are young people that are working, and I usually like to not to disturb them too much by. Sometimes stardom can destroy a young artist because it gets it gets um, um, unfocused. You really need to spend and work them, and that's what we do for artists. We actually try to manage them. We try to show them the direction. So we have few people like that. We'll see you later. I will tell you. We'll have to pay. Name or names? We're gonna back to you. I think that we first have to decide why we're collecting. I do believe in collecting what you love first. Collecting what you want to sit with and look at for a long time. But of course, you know, you can diversify your collection. It's okay to collect to in the hopes that of course it increases value and then maybe you can set up the secondary market. Um, it is a lot of work collecting as an investment because you have to watch the market, you have to watch the artists, you have to watch the ecosystem, who the galleries galleries talking about, what school they're going to, so you have to pay close attention. And the easier way to go about that is, of course, to work with an art consultant, a dealer, a curator, a gallerist, who is doing this full time. Um, and of course, talk to other collectors, see what they're collecting. Um, but I mean, I think you have to still collect what you like. There's no formula for you know for the work. No one's going to tell you. Well, some people will tell you. I mean, I, I've done this sometimes. You know, collect this guy. He's gonna blow. Sometimes, but it's not. It's not always. So I would definitely start with what you love. But attend the fairs, go to the galleries, um, read the art pub publications, um, talk to the to the cultural workers. But it, it is intentional. You have to you have to do the work. You, you don't just stump. You might be lucky, stumble upon. An artist, actually, I remember supporting a curator at her first show, I think, four or five years ago, and I saw a painting that I absolutely loved, and I remember, I thought of a collector. His name popped into my mind, I took a picture, sent it to his WhatsApp, what do you think? He was like, I love it, how much? Great price, buy it, put it on the spot. I mean, the guy's a dozier today, you know, he, he wasn't a dozier back then. And it was it was lucky, but he also had that relationship with me, who was canvassing, going to the shows, and you know building that relationship. So it is work, and so I do suggest um, working with people who are in the space. I'd like to add something to what you said. It's very important to collect art that you like. I, I actually do not recommend any artist to anybody. I say to collectors, either new collectors or old collectors, go to exhibitions, go to galleries. If possible, visit the artist at home. I try to visit one artist maybe once or twice a month. Any morning Saturday, they'll be very happy. And they'll show you things that they don't show anybody. The artist is a peculiar kind of person. He's very appreciative of um, of people that um, admire their work. And you know, I mean, it's a new trend. My father in those days would say, just pay anything you want to pay. He would say things like that. Just pay what you want to pay. He's so happy, first of all, that you left your house wherever to come and meet us in the ghetto where we live. And you know, he's so happy. 
And we will also have a conversation with you about what you really think about his work. He also wants you to constructively criticize his work. He also wants to tell you what his vision is. Maybe, maybe not. He may be able to carry his vision to the next level. So that personal relationship with artists, with the artist or with an artist is very important. You will now get to a level where if an artist makes a new work, a new work, if an artist makes a new work, we just invite you to come and have a look before anybody sees. Now, there's a young man who is one of my father's students. I think a lot of people walk with my father, pass through my father, maybe hundreds of them. There's a young man called Patrick Akojuto. He's not really my friend. Patrick, I see the direction of his work and I, I know that I know there's something there in that guy's crazy mind. I don't know. I've always, I had a fight with him recently, so I don't like him. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. You, you can like a man, you can like an artwork, but you don't like the artist. I mean, if a lot of us lived in the era of Bedou, Bedou was a very eclectic, very temperamental, very restless. And you had to be very patient with him, patient with him. But he was a good artist. So I think that makes up for the other. So the point I'm making is the relationship with the collector, the relationship, sorry, the relationship with the artist. You grow with him, he grows with you. He trusts you. He, he doesn't have money to pay his children's school fees. He can, he can lean on you, he can depend. You know, it's amazing how it pays off. Sorry for all that. Okay. Um, just like you said, you were spurred into the, to the scene. But what, what excites you about the future? Of course, what you do personally, but also of Nigerian arts. Um, I recently had the opportunity to attend World 54 and Freeze in London. Um, and for both our fairs, which are amazing, there's a lot of Nigerian art at the show. Sure. Um, so for, for a start, Nigerian art is on par with global art. There's no, there's no doubt about it. And actually, it's funny enough, Patrick was actually showed in World 54. Um, SM1, I saw some of his works there. Um, it's interesting you mentioned Patrick because Patrick is an artist whose work uh, I admire. Uh, he had a show in Lee Baker about two or three years ago. Um, and also, I will caution, I know this is a, this is a talk about investing in art, and I know that a lot of people here um, uh, approaching this as maybe a store of value. Um, Patrick is an interesting story because um, a couple of years ago, I actually went to Patrick's studio, like you, like you mentioned, and uh, there was a piece I really wanted from him. And I know he, um, he was kind enough to, to, to give me a good price on it, which I didn't act for. Um, today, the price he gave me and the price it is now is, I think at that time we were, I think we had agreed at about maybe 1.5 million, and I had now at his box like 30,000 euros. And that's in the space of a year. But a lot of caution. <laughs> you know, um, it is very, very true what Udume said about like you have to buy art that you love because it doesn't always happen that way that the art you've invested, the art you bought because you like it, first of all, but the art you invested in appreciates. And then I think there's also a danger today that a lot of younger artists. Um, I think African art is, in, is big at the moment, and, and if African art is in or black art is in, there's no way that Nigerian art will not be on the forefront. But I, I do worry that we are um, we're a trend right now. Um, and some of the numbers that we're seeing some of the younger artists call, I want to know if they're still going to call that number in two or three years. 
so there's that caution to say. But that, apart from that, I'm very excited about the Nigerian half for the future because it is, I promise you, it is excellent. Um, and I, you know, I was thinking about this earlier. Um, Nigeria has a lot of problems today. And I think one of our problems right now is the idea of a reliance on oil. I really wish our government would look at the creative industry because I think there's so much potential, and not just in film, which you know about with Nollywood or with music, but with art and even in terms of creative problem solving, um, with the way the tech industry is growing in Nigeria. Art is another industry that could grow like that. And art actually is one of the reasons why I, 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 okay, so my, I worked in interior design for the last eight years. And for a lot of our clients, we did port furniture in, we had to do with customs and and all things about Naira shifting. What I like about being in art, I actually look at art now as an export commodity. We have so much attention on Nigerian art now. And it's something that we produce locally, we produce, I mean, look like we, sorry, the arts produce in their house. There's no idea of lorry driver, nepa, all the things that Nigeria can use to, to spoil you. That's a very interesting thing in that this art is able to work in the silo, create this amazing work that international people actually want. This is the future. Creativity is the future for Nigeria, and art is one very big part of it. So I'm very, very excited about Nigerian art for the future of Nigeria. <coughs> in addition to what he said, the caveat is very important. The caveat is that, look, this art you are buying may not amount to anything. It may not. So the question is that, would you be able to live with the art you bought for 30, 40 years? Okay, he said that um, the global market, Nigeria is now at par with the global market. And my question is that, has Nigerian art not always been at par with the global market? It has always been. It's just an awakening, a realization that, ah, who is doing this? Now, the question now is that, what if those that are focusing on Nigerian art now, what if they take their eyes away from Nigerian art? Are we not going to continue to produce? I'll tell you something that happened in China. Um, the Europeans were buying a lot of Chinese art. And um, at a point, they said, this art is not, it's not that exciting anymore. It did not stop the European art, sorry, not Chinese, Japanese. It did not stop the Japanese artists from working. They continued to work. They were not making as much work, but they continued to work. They continued to work, 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 work. And after about 20 years, the Euro Europeans came back and there was a gap. The Europeans said, look, there's a gap in the collection of your art for about 20 years. And then there was a new rush towards Japanese art. So you see, market is funny. Market is not predictable. So if you buy art solely for investment, it may not work. But if you ask me, I will buy art for investment. Okay. That kind of leads me to question what I wanted to ask you. Ask me that how do you go about it? How do you feel safe in collecting and investing in art? galleries. I mean, there are some that I, I know well, so I think Red Bull Gallery um, in Lagos, Fort Worth, um, My Dream, actually the same road, the Norman Williams Road, right, there's like Fort Worth, My Dream, and also like Shegma David Moore has a studio there, so it's like you can kind of get three in one street, is where I started. Um, now I actually buy a lot of art, to be honest, directly from the artists sort of on Instagram, so for younger artists, a lot of them will put their stuff all on Instagram. Um, typically, like how I search is, I find a young artist that I like, and then I see who they're following. What I find about like young artists, like the core, like they all like know each other, they all follow each other, and so like seeing who like young artists or like museum creators that you respect are following, I think is a really interesting way to discover like new pieces. Um, and those are the two ways. So I haven't tread into like the drop buying online or like from RT and stuff like that. I haven't done that. It's usually from Instagram, directly from the artist. I see who they're following. I see who they're tagging. That's my younger artist strategy. Um, for the older artists, 
I'm spending a lot of time with like galleries and curators. Um, I think like maybe then I'm just talking about this. I don't know whether you said it when we were just talking about before. But we're just having a discussion about like how a lot of all the artists in Nigeria are overlooked, especially I think by younger collectors. Um, and I'm so grateful to have someone like Uguna and Obida who actually very much like appreciate older artists. Um, so I really, really encourage people to like take some of them as well. Like it's, they have some really amazing stuff and I'm so sad that there's so many of them are overlooked right now. So I, I'm happy to call names, but I can do that later. But there, there are some really amazing cool yes, artists. Call names. Okay. I will, sorry. One of my favorites right now. I, I love Shen La Dejuma. I really think his stuff is amazing. Please don't go and buy everything because I'm looking to go back. Um, I love Obi Ohibo. Her stuff is amazing. It's really whimsical. It's mystical. It's so layered in meaning. It's the type of art that you see and it really makes you feel something. Sometimes you don't even know what you're feeling until you've actually had time to sit and tease out your feelings. Um, for mid-career, like Cyril Omar, I mean, he has my heart. I love him so much. Red Door Gallery, like, they represent him. I think those are kind of three sort of, like, mid-career old artists that I, I just think are so amazing, and I, I hope more people look at them. Sorry. They, they're not paying me. I just love them. <laughs> I think a lot of younger artists are very hot, very trendy. Um, there are a lot of young artists that I, I, I do also um, follow and invest in. It's all, actually. A lot of the younger artists that I keep following me as they begin, and so I, I see what they have been involved recently, and then I follow up from young artists. That's my young artist blog. Um, but I understand that this um, forum is about advising you on how to invest in art. Um, and as much as we say buy what you love, I think you require some practical skills as well. So um, if you're investing in Nigerian art, so if you're investing in art, first of all, um, I think you're, you're going to have two directions you're going in. You're going to want to have art that you believe will appreciate, uh, we'll call that your riskier portfolio, but you also want to invest in art that you know will hold value. Um, and even in the third case, uh, sometimes you even want art that's very liquid. And often enough, that's not unique to Nigeria. Um, even internationally, um, quite not in the 70s, but let's say from 2008 with the stock market crash, art actually became a proper investment grade vehicle. Where people were looking for something that could hold value instead of currency which was fluctuating and especially and then furthermore with entrance of the Asians into the art market in South America. So art globally is not just here when people are approaching art as an investment um, vehicle. Now if that's a case of your approaching art for the investment purposes only, well, what I then advise to you is that they are um, is that you now start looking at the older artists. You look at artists who are career artists who have been in here for a good 20, 30 years. Uh, names that I've mentioned to you um, as tips. Anolaku oh, is incredible. Anolaku is, if a tip for you, Anolaku is, is the most liquid, I think, today piece you can have. I have um, I have some, and I know I, if I wanted money today, in two hours, I can sell, I can get the cash value of Anolaku immediately. So, Anolaku is good. Um, there's some of the older artists sort of like the Duke. I will say I am a bit biased here just because they are exhibiting Duke next week at our gallery. So I, I, I say that first of all. But artists like Duke, for instance, that by, Duke's value is constant. I mean, you know, there's some people that don't, you know. Uh, and there's a lot of sort of other artists who I mentioned in that sort of grade. Uh, living artists, sorry. I was sad they said a lot. I don't want you to put people on me. I'm still trying to get my own. So <laughs> that was the one. So in case you wanted me, I have a couple of other older, older artists like that that we can mention. Um, so mix it. Don't um, if you you can go for the young artists you think going to appreciate, but also try and also do the older artists as well so that your your portfolio like any other thing that you invest in is balanced. Thank you. I think I'll also ask you this question about what excites you about <coughs> the future. I mean, we are in a group together again bit of uh, transparency, but what, what excites you personally? The future of Nigerian art is the uh, the fact is overwhelming when I think about it because um, we have such amazing skills from the young artists to the old artists. Now, everybody on that value chain 
in from the production of selling art to the from the production of art to the sale of art is very important. You spoke about um, Shekman Ijimo, and I think he may have insinuated that people do not um, pay attention to him. Now, there's a responsibility from the artist and from his managers and the curators to showcase from time to time the new things that artists are doing. For example, there's no reason why an artist should not, a stable studio artist should not have one solo exhibition once in two years, once in three years, if they're strong enough once every year. What are you saying? You are telling people that, look, I'm still around, I'm still working, and I'm doing something new. Now, something new. Because, you see, the, 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 the collectors are also very interested in people. Maybe they don't want to see the same old things. Maybe they want to see you twist a little bit in this direction. Maybe they want to see you. They want to see something that will wow them. Now, there are two kinds of artists. There's the conceptual artist and there's the experimental artist. The conceptual artist is an artist that you know his style, you know his colors, you know how he paints, and that's all you really get. So you recognize his work. Now there's also the experimental artist. He's a little more exciting for me. The experimental artist is the one that, okay, this particular year, this is rainbow colors. He's doing different colors, happy colors, for a period of five, seven years. He exhibits. Now, the next period of his life, he's doing subtle colors, F colors. Different motifs. He's probably going so much to do some experimental work. And he's even using new medium. Now, for me, those are the artists that are catchy. Because the other artists, I will buy one, two, three, and that's it. I'm okay. I'm not sure I want to have some more. Well, there's some artists that keep coming up with something new. Whenever you see them, you're like, wow, how did you get here? So you see, there must be a combination of those two things. Back to the question. Sorry, can you? Um, <laughs> the, the future of artists. <laughs> Sorry, man. The future of artists is amazing, and um, I wish I could be able to go all over again. Um, there's a lot to be done because this art belongs to us. It has always been with us. I mean, I started my first gallery two years after I left university in 1994. My first gallery. At the time I started my gallery in Lagos, the Palette Art Gallery, people thought I was going crazy because I borrowed money to rent an apartment in Kefi Street in Ikoi. What do you want to sell? Art? I know people that told me categorically to my face that you can't sustain, this business cannot sustain you. I said, well, I love the business. Even if I go to my gallery every day and look at my nice piece of work, that may be enough. Unfortunately, after a couple of years, I got restless. I closed that gallery and I went to America. But I'm back. I'm back into the art business now. Now, there's something new that has come out of ownership of art. I don't know if you've heard of the NFTs. That is digitalization of art. In simple terms, it means that a piece of art can be owned by numerous people. A piece of art can be divided into 100 pieces, a piece of art. 100 pieces, 1,000 pieces. And 
There will be a neutral place where they will be stored for good temperature, pressure, and security. But the art is owned by a number of people. Now, when the art appreciates, everybody gets value. Hopefully, the art is not going to depreciate. But a lot of people now own the same art. So, what, what does that really do? That means that people can actually share in the ownership and enjoy a piece of art. And in the future, if that piece, for example, was bought at 100,000 naira, and the future is 100 million naira, everybody that owns it will benefit from it. It's an interesting mix, which um, I'm still researching, but art is going in that direction. Thank you so much. Last but not least, the final question from here, then we move to the audience. Ugona? Um, so, like I said, as I mentioned earlier, I am a director of a very professional and artist in Nigeria, so I do have a special interest in the career and established artists, and I do believe in you know, the growth and the increased value, and because of that, while some artists may not be hot right now, I still collect their works because I love it and people have been reading it. And if I want their works to grow, then I should also uh, own them. I collect Nobre Oku, who's actually been exhibited um, inside the club. Um, I should mention that the curation, I do the curation inside the lounge, so please take a look. Everything's on sale, so you can come and talk to me after that. <laughs> One of the artists is actually with us somewhere, Ama Ichiogu, who works flat the, um, the entry, the door to the lounge. Um, I did want to go back to what Ibrahim was saying about, you know, investing in the creative industry. I think that the key to sustainably investing in Nigerian art is to invest in the Nigerian ethos, art ecosystem. Right, so we need more valuable creative institutions from Nigeria. Um, we've talked about this being, it could be a phase, it could be five years, it could be 10 years, we're trending right now, and we can't rely on the West dictating Nigeria, the value of Nigeria. And so investing in residencies that happen on the continent, that happen in Nigeria, investing in the galleries, investing in um, and Shion Museum is a good addition to the art ecosystem. Art X is doing excellent work. Red Gallery is doing excellent work. She has her residency as well. But in these spaces, you can only name one is wrong. There is one residency. There is one fair. There is, you know, the art auctions. Art House has been doing, you know, a good job. Um, the Terraculture art auctions don't occur anymore. But we need to be able, it helps your collection grow, you can invest in the ecosystem entirely. And that is the way to sort of invest sustainably rather than, you know, chasing, chasing the artists right now, chasing, wondering what the West is saying. And then when they drop it, we're back at square one. You know, so we want to be able to sustain our industry. Um, of course, amplification, increase in value cannot just happen in Nigeria. We still need the systems in the West, but we should also be able to dictate, you know, who we think is valuable and have it sort of extend from there. Um, and that's uh, my contribution. Um, so for me, I think NFTs, much like any medium, is what's hot right now. I don't think it's replacing traditional art anytime soon. But the same way portraiture is exciting right now, we might eventually go into more abstraction and collage, but right now we're on NFTs. I think that it has so much attention. We're excited that one of the most popular artists is Osunachi, is a Nigerian. So of course that is going to bring more attention to just the Nigerian art space in general. I do think that for right now, NFTs is a, creators market. I think that if you can contribute 
works right now, it's the easiest way to get involved. Uh, much in the same way as collecting traditional art and sort of needing, not needing, but relying on a gallerist or a curator to sort of hold your hand. NFTs is a bit trickier. So if you're not watching, you know, it's harder to tell what's going to be valuable, when it's going to be valuable. It's a very specific collector base. And that's why I say it's a creator's market because rather than sort of over expanding or focusing your energy on being a collector, expanding that base, you want to go to it. I always, the analogy I say, it's like um, collecting baseball cards and collecting Pokemon cards, right? It's not everybody's thing. A lot of people are not interested in collecting NFTs, but if you're lucky enough to sort of be educated in the space or be connected to somebody who is educated in the space, you buy the right one, the idea is to sort of set it off, right? So if you happen on a baseball card, you're gonna go to the collector base. You're not gonna shop around just anywhere for it. So, so I think it is very specific. I don't think NFTs are going anywhere either. I just don't think that they are replacing traditional art. I think they'll be here for a long time. And it's interesting, it's a, a facet of digital art and I love it. And um, we discussed this um, yesterday at Turkey's luncheon as well. And she made the same point where, you know, it is now an avenue for that specific type of artist to make money, to be able to monetize this skill, monetize this career. Um, so those are my thoughts on it. Um, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, no, I, I have <laughs> thoughts on it, please. Okay, so... The way I'm thinking about how it's going, I think I've been looking at the space for a while. I think there are two things I'm thinking, they're not fully formulated yet. So I think the first one is, um, I think that there will be interesting opportunities for NFT artists as we think about um, like virtual universes. Um, and I think that you have to make a bet on to what extent you think that more people are going to be engaging in these like, you know, the metaverse, like virtual universes. because. If that indeed happens, then you'll have more companies who will essentially be looking for characters, art, whatever pieces to put in their quote unquote metaverse, right? So what you could hypothetically get is an NFT that you can essentially rent out. The way I think about it is imagine if I built a whole bunch of NFTs that are like video game characters, right? Like Shungu, da -da -da -da, I make it cool, I make it sexy, and I actually rent it out to video game collect like video game makers, right? And so they're paying me like a monthly fee or whatever to like use that. So whereas before, if I was making a video game, I'd have to create all the characters. Now I might actually be able to like buy them in stock. So I think if I was investing in NFTs, I'd be looking a lot at like comic book type characters and like how those can be used in like the gaming universe. I think that's one thing that'll be interesting. Um, I, I think that the second thing for NFTs is it's really thinking about like the creation of like fractional like fractional ownership of art, I think, which Asia spoke about, which has never been done really before. What the piece of that that I think is missing is what is the cash flow that is gonna come from that asset, right? So great, 10 of us now own this art piece. If one person wants to sell it, sure, maybe they can fractionally own it, but like really ideally what you want in these things is an asset that creates cash flow. So I think what would need to be solved first is like, if NFTs are created, what is the cash flow stream, right? Like, if I make music, the cash flow stream is when it's played on Spotify or when it's played on, you know, the radio, and that then makes sense for me to invest in it fractionally because then I'm getting like my whatever royalty or whatever every year. It's unclear what that's going to be for NFTs if, unless you believe the metaverse, the creation of video game characters, like those types of things. That's where I think it's going to. If I was investing in NFTs, as I said. It would be video game characters and like creating African video game characters and then thinking about how I then sell that on to video game um, um, creators is how I think about it. Um, you spoke about the currency. That is to say that for example, your laptop, if you wanted to sell it in two hours, you'd be able to sell it. Now, um, <clears throat> I have always thought about a system where there's something like an art exchange. <clears throat> an art exchange. 
which is similar to a stock exchange. Now, the people in the art exchange, the owners or the system, you know, they have artists, they have curators, they have people documenting, they have prize strategists, they have international um, affiliations and all that. So that, for example, if they bring a piece of art to the art exchange, if you bring a piece of art to the art exchange, they should be able to translate that piece of art into currency immediately because somebody else somewhere wants that piece or that kind of piece. I don't know if I if you understand that. The art exchange is more widely advertised and there are more people that will participate. And um pardon? More than well, that's all that they do. Auctions are auctions are like celebrated exhibitions. And some of these will announce that they're auctions. But I'm talking about a system that continues from day to day, year in, year out. Okay. You have a better own artwork and you can translate it into money immediately. You go there, they value it, they give you a discount, and they give you your money. Somebody else in America wants that piece, and you know, it's like a stock exchange. It's something that's been on my mind for like 20 years, but I think that that kind of system will help the NFTs. That kind of system will help the currency of the NFTs. I'm not particularly sure about what I'm saying, but it will help. But I hope I have made a point or two. So I consider myself a daily collector. I, you know, I, I have a growing collection, and I just collect things I like, and I have no intent of selling it or anything. Um, but I've realized, like, the growth of African art or Nigerian art, you've seen a lot of, I, I guess, painting as a medium is what I see sort of um, doing really well. And so I'm wondering, just in terms of other mediums of art, because I know there's, I mean, we have a big, um, you know, sculpture, you know, we have, like, so many different kinds of artists. So how do we see the growth of those other artists that aren't painting or doing fine art? Uh, I'll, I'll answer that for you. Uh, so it's interesting you mentioned that because I'm actually I'm very keen on sculptures. I, I personally in my collection I actually collect a lot of sculptures. I think maybe because of my interior design um, side, um, uh, but even internationally, um, the most popular form of art is actually painting for, uh, for, for, for a variety of reasons. Um, so okay, first of all, we we'll discuss what the difference of art and the, just the top what you call it. You have paintings on the walls, you have sculptures, you have installations. Um, it's, 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 so um, one of the reasons why paintings are the most popular is also just because it's the easiest to deal with. Um, with sculptures you have depending on the size, um, you think of where it fits, um, you think of families, um, if you if your kids will knock it over or things like for instance we have this um, large wooden sculptures by Alimi that we um, that I'm very keen on but then the way it turns and like I imagine like a child you know playing with it and it falls on them so um, globally um, every for every what it was painted on the walls are the most popular uh, they move the the fastest um, that said. Um, there are uh, a number of artists who do well with sculptures. Uh, presently, um, I would say um, probably Alimi is, uh, is one of the most uh, contemporary, in terms of contemporary new career artists. Uh, but some of the other people that I'm really keen on is Mr. Ruben, who, who passed away recently. I love Mr. Ruben's sculptures, I really do. Uh, he's, a, he's incredible. Um, you have Mr. Boma. Um, He's not as popular as he should be because he makes beautiful work with Ebony Wood. Uh, we have Mr. Valentine Day, 
PW message as well, Zena as well. Uh, you have um, uh, Odogu, uh, Felix Odogu, he's also a good water sculpture. You have a guy called Dotu who does this like big metal, um, what's called, you can't obviously, uh, you know, Mr. Rukpaya, who does amazing, amazing sculptures as well. Um, but we do find that paintings are a lot more popular. And even if all you need to get Hatsune come to the gallery uh, to, to add to their collection. And paintings of similar value to sculpture, with paintings, the, let's say it was 10 naira. Okay, but a sculpture of 10 naira was thought to be expensive. Even though, in my opinion, the sculpture was a lot more valuable. It was bronze, it was. So it's just, it's an approach. Um, but I do find that a lot of collectors don't do sculptures and they don't do photography as well. That's another medium that's quite hard to do for Nigerian collectors. Right, I need to sell, you know. So one thing I will advise a collector, you know, if you find an artist that you love and you love your medium, share it. Share it amongst your friends, share it amongst your collector friends to see if they're interested and then they can buy and then it just sort of runs, it's a ripple effect. I remember, I mean, in the last, Two, three years ago, a lot of young collectors were not talking about mid-career artists at all. I remember being in a, a clubhouse conversation, I was banging on about mid-career artists, and I introduced a young collector who's a fantastic collection, but he'd never even heard of Abel Mulaku. And after that, he was in love, and more, more of his friends were talking about it and wanting to collect it. So, I mean, I think those sorts of things help. That is part of sort of creating value. You don't always, if you don't have the money to invest in an artist or invest in a program, you can share his work and encourage other artists to consider his work and buy his work. That is one way, you know, to create the value. And if I can add this point as well, I think, I feel like all of us on the stage are purists and we will say collect what you love first. Um, but there might be some people who are not, you know, and they just want to collect art as investment for profit. And I think one thing, if you are that dogged about it, then you have to be a part of creating that value. So, you know, buy more of those pieces and talk about those pieces. Invest in a, in a show, in a residency. You have to create that art. Form an art club. We all decide to buy certain artists. You have to be strategic about it if that's, you know, if that's the way you want to go. You have to be a part of creating that value. Performance and art which are distinct in Nigeria. Um, from a little bit of what's been said so far, reason we're going. So recently, I just saw the gentleman in Brazil, so what we're talking about, using elements from the environment to build art. And mixed media is, for my opinion, a very distinctly Nigerian art form, which is something we need to embrace and encourage more because it's unique, it's, it's derived from things our artists have accessible. The second thing is um, I'm well, I don't know, I don't know what the proper term is, but uh, I'm hard work that's work from iron. So with your bronzes, your iron works, your those kind of things, those are also very distinctly Nigerian. And also they are historic there's historical heritage for us. So if you look at uh, National Stadium, for instance, uh, not National Stadium, uh, race course. Race course, you've got a lot of photos um, Bronze or just iron work pieces, but those are historically significant for Nigeria. You've got our Benin bronzes, you've got our Ife bronzes, and you know, much of Nigeria has a shared uh, culture. So I think it's just something that we need to get away from this westernization. So I think another reason why a lot of us uh, focus on painting is because of what we see in the news. You know, we all watch uh, Thomas Crown Affair and we all look at movies and we see painting and we all start doing an art and we see paintings, which are not necessarily what is uniquely us culturally. So I, I just thought to say that we should focus on, or we should take more cognizance of art that is uniquely Nigerian. Hi, so um, I've got, I don't know, I think one is comment and one is question. Um, the first one, there was something you had said, Miss Ezra. Sorry, I'm a, I'm a baby in art, so I'm going to pretend like I know it all. Um, you said something very profound about how, after some time, the rest of the world could find our art not as interesting anymore, just like the Japanese story. Something clicked there. 
it usually has to do with what's a contemporary topic. What is the world talking about? And I mentioned this yesterday. I don't know if this was our here yesterday. It has to do with clean, um, the clean world, the environment. How are we going to work in a very um, more sustainable way as humans? And I think that's something we need to look at as African artists. They're talking about, you mentioned plastics, recycling. Whatever you find that is so close to you that you don't have to spend a lot of money on. The world now values that, right? So you need to speak to your artists to start to think like this so that they don't forget about us. So I think it's about staying contemporary with the world's topic. You know, and I just want to just mention. Another thing, I'm really artist, as I said. Um, about, I really like sculptures and things, and I always find that they tell a story themselves, probably more than your paintings. And I spoke to an artist, and he had said to me, Yoni, I think Nigerian artists are doing fantastically well. When next you're coming from Nigeria, can you bring like miniature versions of these things? And he started sending stuff to me. And he was saying, I think the reason why sculptures are not doing so well is because moving them around the world is not as easy. So he was saying to me, why don't you do miniature versions? Put it in your suitcase you know, and bring it to me. I, I know it's pretty far-fetched, but so I don't know if you would like to respond to that. Is that, um, could that be the reason why it's not as popular as what you rely solely on oil? And it's very interesting the point that you raised. But what practical steps do you think the government can take in order to help the arts world to be able to probably like a plausible um, choice in terms of something where we can earn our currency, especially because we know some of the um, peculiarities of art, temperature control, when you're trying to export, things like that. And then also harnessing the talent, because we have the talent. There's so many talented people here that are actually work in the art field. So what practical steps? Because I think, you know, the thing is, a lot of us complain and we actually um, have um, lots of good points. But if you want to help in the public space, especially considering the fact that art will be very foreign to them, it would be useful to give them you know, tips as to what they can actually do. So, <laughs> and I kind of, this morning, when I think about this talk, it's something I want to say to all of you um, collectors and people who love art and concerts of art, and even if people are interested in art as an investment, you have to be nicer to the artist. You see what they're going through. You understand that. You understand in your industry what you're going through. But a creative mind is even more fragile than what's called to create. And you know, I think one of the reasons why I work really well with us is because I'm an interior designer. I know what I face when I'm creating. Yo, you need a nice. You need to be in a nice place. I don't mean physically, like in a nice place mentally to be able to create. And so collectors and investors be nicer to artists. Pay them properly. Pay them on time. Um, and understand that, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to, you can't do what they're doing. So respect their creativity. I think start them. And I don't know if you do it for them, but you can do it for them. And if, and if you do it for them, you will benefit from it. Idealistic to, to hope that the government's going to step in. But I can't say, sort of, I guess, highlight the gaps, essentially, where we would be like, oh, yeah, step in. But also, maybe if you two can step in. <laughs> But, I mean, when you look at the West, you have, I mean, if you go to Yale, you know, you're pretty much, you know, certified to be a renowned artist, you know, investing in our art schools, again, which were once renowned, right? Um, we don't have public art. We're not, the government is not commissioning public art. Our national galleries and national museums are pretty much not operating, right? If there was that sort of, um, national backing to the artists, you know, you want to say, oh, this Nigerian artist showed up in the Nigerian Museum, you know, we don't have that, we can't say that, these are the massive gaps that they're in. When he talks about artists needing the environment to work in, most of these artists are, are struggling, and the whole point of residencies, even in the West, while you might not be a struggling artist, you might be working full time, but you need to work full time. And so the residency affords you three months, six months of a salary, of materials, of space where you can sit and you can be 
create. You don't have to worry about your bills. You don't have to worry about anything but your work. Nobody, I mean, it's very rare for a Nigerian artist to have that, you know, that opportunity. So, you know, investing in, in city, um, environments like that for them. So those are just kind of some places if you feel that you can plug in at a smaller scale, obviously you can't pick up from the Nigerian government, but I feel like in every industry we're all uh, many governments anyway, you know? So that's why panels like this, you know, it's just sharing what the gaps are and seeing what role you can play you know, um, within your capacity. Um, thank you very much. Um, I know there's still a bit of um, I think it's very instructive and very interesting that we're having a conversation like this. Um, the topic also investing in Nigerian art. Um, I think um, I own a gallery, Pedro knows that. I, I started out as a collector, I collected one too many. Um, and, um, well, you were starting a gallery, you didn't tell me. <laughs> and, um, you know, last year was very, you know, interesting. Uh, you know, I was uh, out jogging, and someone said, "Hey, you have too much art." You have, so I tried to start a gallery, and then uh, I'm doing it, and it's very interesting. But you know, the topic today is what I want to focus on: investing in Nigerian art. You know, there are two reasons why people buy art: people buy art for pleasure, people buy art for profit. So there's two sides of the continent. Um, I think the primary reason why most people buy art, you know, would be for, for pleasure. But I think there are a lot of people who are savvy as well and looking at the, look, and look at it as an investment class, like you would gold, currency, uh, shares, stocks, you know. But um, I want to tell a story, you know, which I hope will encourage a lot of people here. So when I started my gallery, I started out looking at young emerging and young artists. And uh, I'm not going to name names, but I bought a piece of art for 50,000 naira. And when I started my gallery, I put three million naira on it. It was bought the next, the first day we opened the gallery. I think um, the art now is in Denmark, and I think it's in a gallery there for about 20,000 for now, something like that, for what reason. But what that says is there is a great appreciation of Nigerian artists and Nigerian art. There is um, a very subjective view to art, but it's also how you create it, how you package it how you manage it and how you, you know, the story behind it, and that's what people really buy into. And I think as Nigerians, we need to collectively begin to promote our own in a way that is appreciated and valued behind it. Thank you. Children can get touch on because now you live in a new digital economy where kids understand what NFTs are, blockchain, and those sort of things. I'm not sure if any of the panelists have touched on the importance of kids. When Mandela was alive, he mentioned that because you really want to change the world, if you want to create new models, focus on children. So I think if there's a continuation of this talk, if you talk about how kids will be part of the conversation. Thank you. It definitely sounds like a continuation of, of, of the talk. But on my behalf, the panelists all the people that came here, thank you so much for spending your Thursday evening with us. We'd like to thank Capital Club once again, Money Night Distilleries. There is some head of peas and finger foods and more wine. So please enjoy yourselves, network, and have a good evening from my side. Thank you so much.